Hi, and welcome to the New York State Museum Women in Science series. My name is Kathleen Bonk, and I'm a geology technician here for the Open File Collection. As a woman in science, you may think of doing fieldwork, or lab work, or research and publications. Those are all accurate. However, for today, I'd like to tell you how I use my science background to manage a paper collection. I have a degree in geology, and my career track began at the museum 10 years ago in the traditional sense. I worked in the field helping to retrieve samples, and I also worked in a lab helping to analyze them. However, about five years ago, my path changed and I began overseeing the open file collection. This collection consists of over 10,000 unpublished, one-of-a-kind records. There are maps, field notebooks, reports, theses, and aerial photographs in the collection. Open file records come from scientists from all over the state, and believe it or not, a lot of their information and research doesn't get published, but it's important and useful just the same. For example, when scientists go for their master's or doctorate in geology, they have to submit a thesis or a dissertation. In the past, these may not have been published or kept by the university. So they were sent here to the open file collection. So now, when someone wants to study a specific topic, we can check to see if the student has worked on it already. Some of our records here are over 100 years old. For example, this is a map we have in the collection that's from 1902. If it weren't for the open file collection, this record may have fallen into disrepair or been lost altogether. In addition to the maps and theses that I've showed you, we also have other types of records in the collection. As you'll see here, we have aerial photographs, and they were taken in 1968. They show what the terrain looked like back then, and that is really good for comparison to how things look today. We also have field notebooks. Field notebooks were used by researchers and still are for when they are in the field. They write down everything they are exploring so they can look at it when they get back to the museum. This is an interesting one from 1944. As you can see, these records need to be taken care of. I do that in a few different ways. One way is by organizing them. As easy as that may sound, it was a bit of an undertaking. When I took over this collection, there hadn't been a manager for some time, and the records were in disarray. Come on, I'll show you. Right here we have an example of a drawer that has not been rehoused yet. As you can see, it is a bit overstuffed. There are multiple items in the bags, and these bags themselves are actually acidic. They're not good for preserving documents. They can make the documents deteriorate over time. If you come a little farther down, I'd like to show you an example of how we've already fixed the collection. This drawer is a perfect example of what we've done. It looked exactly like the other drawer, but since then we have housed each of the documents in their own acid-free folders. This prevents any deterioration from happening to them. In addition, since they are each housed individually, they will not be touching each other or deteriorating any further. Here's another example of how the documents were not stored properly. You can see these reports are frayed and still in plastic binders and with metal clips. A finished project will look like this. Each report stored in its own acid-free folder, organized with all metal, plastic, and tape removed. We also digitize records using a variety of scanners. This large format scanner is the most commonly used due to the nature of the collection. For the sake of continued preservation, original materials are never loaned out, even within the museum. Only digital files are provided to requesters. Once these records are made digital, they are uploaded and maintained on a museum database and will someday be available publicly. Now that I've told you a little bit about the collection, I'd like to tell you how it's used for research. Scientists ask me for information that could be useful for their work in the field and in the lab. I use my science background to interpret their request and locate useful data that they might need. 
If I did not have a degree in geology, I would not be able to do that because I wouldn't be able to interpret these documents. For example, I received a request asking for information about a road construction project. The geology in the area was complicated, and the requester needed me to figure out what documents would best help them. This map is an example of what I found to fulfill the request. They wanted to alter a road, so they needed to know about the bedrock geology in the area. I did that by finding a map that includes strike and dip measurements. These symbols show how the layers of bedrock are oriented. The triangle here shows which way the rocks dip, and the line shows the direction they point or strike. In this case, the beds dip 85 degrees to the northeast, and they strike to the northwest. This information helps the road workers decide how to approach the job and what tools will be necessary for them to shape the new section of road. This image shows how a flat road looks in an area that actually has tilted bedrock. This is another example of a researcher requesting information. This time they wanted to put a power line under a river. And by understanding and analyzing cross sections, I could provide the appropriate data for their project. In this case, we have a cross section that includes detailed information about the geology under a river. We also work across sciences sometimes. For example, a fellow scientist that works here needed data on a particular area so she could locate archaeological samples in the field. In this case, she needed to know how deep bedrock was so she knew where to dig and where not to dig. And as we saw earlier, the collection isn't just maps. Sometimes requests come in that require me to read the reports so I can provide the scientists with the right information. Since our topic is women in science, let me tell you about the first woman state paleontologist that worked right here at the New York State Museum. Winifred Goldring worked at the museum for over 42 years and became the state paleontologist in 1939. Winifred had a great career and accomplished many things. She's best known for her research on the Gilboa Forest. It's the oldest complete fossil forest in the world. Interestingly, though, she actually went to college to study classical languages. It wasn't until she took mandatory science classes that she realized how much she loved science. This is one of her notebooks that are stored in the Open Bio Collection. This is from her work in Coxsackie, New York. It may be hard to see, but these are all of her notes on what she found in the area. There could be anything in here from what the weather was on a particular day to a specific fossil she may have found. So as you can see, even though I manage a collection of paper documents and I don't do science in the traditional way, I am doing science every day while also preserving a valuable collection for future scientists.